All right. Uh, hi, I'm Dave. How's everyone doing today? All right. All right, excellent. I'm excited for this event. Uh, if they hadn't asked me to moderate it, I'd be attending. Um, and I'm extremely excited to have uh, the insights of Greg Gray's here today. So hopefully everyone here feels the same way. Um, so just a little bit about me, so you know who's who's helping kind of moderate this. Uh, my background uh, is in both uh, right now cybersecurity. I'm a product owner at a cybersecurity company called Carbon Black. Uh, I've been there for about a year. They just IPO'd, so it's been a very cool kind of startup experience in, in that regard. Uh, before that, I was doing uh, app development. I founded an app called Do List. It has about 8,000 monthly users, uh, 4.6 average rating on the store. Uh, it's been a very good experience uh, still doing that on the side. Um, so that's a, a little bit about my background uh, and why I'm so excited to be here today. Um, so we are uh, lucky enough to have Greg here, and I'll invite him up in just one minute. I did just want to get a quick feeling uh, for, for who's sitting in the audience today so that we can try to kind of moderate this appropriately and make sure to keep things on the right topic that uh, will be kind of helpful and interesting for everybody. So can I just get a, a few quick questions out here with some answers by raising of hands? Uh, so question one is, how many people here are founders or part of a very small startup, let's say less than 10 people? Uh, raise a hand. Great, perfect, thank you. Uh, so next question, uh, how many people here are uh, here to be more interested in sort of growth uh, strategies? All right, great, hands down. Uh, engagement? All right. Hands down. Stickiness, kind of related, right? Uh, okay, so good. We have a lot of overlap in that regard. Um, from a technical point of view, uh, kind of development, back-end, scale-type questions, uh, interest in, in the, the more technical side. Uh, raise of hands if, if that's hoping, something you're hoping to get out today. Okay, great. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so just as a, a quick... Uh, introduction to how today will go. So we'll be asking uh, five different people who were selected beforehand who sent in questions to come up. Uh, I'll be watching the time. We're going to try to keep it uh, to 10 minutes, but you'll be able to come up on stage and have a conversation with Greg, uh, get your questions out, have follow-up questions. Um, if we go past 10 minutes, I, I will kind of kind of give you a little gentle reminder that we have to move on so everyone has enough time. Uh, there is a Q&A at the end, so if you weren't one of those five people but you have questions, uh, we will have time for that. In between that, uh, Greg and I will have about a 10-minute uh, kind of quick fireside chat between the, the five people coming on stage and the Q&A. Uh, after that, Greg has, has already uh, told me he's very open to uh, people reaching out via Twitter and, and asking him questions there. So if you, if you don't get into that last Q&A, that's an option as well. Um, so with no further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Greg Reyes, who is the CIO of Brightpoint, uh, founded uh, Reyes Labs, who, uh, has, which was a company for 17 years, uh, growing big Fortune 500, Fortune 100 apps. Uh, Runkeeper was one of the earliest apps they worked on, and it was a tremendous success. Uh, and he was telling me about that one. Uh, and very quick little anecdotal story about that is that uh, they bet on GPS before there was a, a GPS chip announced in the app. So a company that was not afraid of making bold moves uh, and certainly earned their place in the marketplace due to those bold moves and strategic decision making. 17 years later, I uh, became, became part of Rightpoint and is now the, the CIO uh, of Rightpoint, which is a, a digital platform uh, for digital strategy and consulting. So uh, very honored, very uh, lucky to all be here with Greg today. Greg? You're in the red chair. Test? Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. I'm uh, excited to be here, answer all your questions. Um, uh, as you heard, I've been working on apps since before the App Store, really building a multitude of products across a number of different industries from health and fitness, wellness, uh, financial, entertainment, uh, kind of you name it. We've probably helped launch over 100 different types of products, uh, and so I've seen lots of uh, both startups, founders, entrepreneurs, and very large established companies uh, approaching both mobile and web-based applications and kind of helping them advise, think about innovation. Um, I started my company, Raise Labs, 
after leaving Microsoft where I was a product manager on a little operating system called Windows XP. And uh, my personal passion is uh, improving lives through technology and design. So I love to give back to the community. And, and if you have questions that aren't answered here, reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at G and then R-A-I-Z. Uh, I'm happy to answer your questions and uh, excited to be here. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, so our, our first uh, question today will be from uh, Karthi Chandra. Uh, Karthi, are you here? All right, come on up. Testing. Testing. Is that coming through? It doesn't. You can take mine. Thank you. Ready? Awesome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hi, my name is Karthi. I'm one of the co-founders of Golden Hour, and we're building a productivity app that's geared towards self-improvement. Okay. We combine the realms of task management scheduling and personal development to encourage people to bring a lot of their goals and routines to the forefront of their planning process. So right now we're about at an MVP stage, actively beta testing, uh, and just trying to really understand what it takes to successfully launch an app in the App Store, like what promotional marketing needs to happen, how do you get featured in the App Store, how do you make a splash in general? Sure. Um, I'll kind of start off by saying that uh, most of the long-term successful products that we've seen in the App Store are built on tools that encourage habits that lots of times people already have, and you're providing tools or technology to facilitate or encourage that habit or behavior. Um, Apple, in particular, loves to promote very polished products and applications, and so uh, oftentimes the way I encourage entrepreneurs to get traction and kind of have a splash, so to speak, is less about the big launch party and more about having a product that delivers a ton of value. Um, there's absolutely value to having a splash and a reveal and saying, hey, you know, we're launching on Wednesday or whatever. Um, but even before that, using your early testing to build a following of people who you're really getting valuable information and you're getting the app to be very sticky. And so uh, both Apple and Google have tools to allow you to do uh, beta testing internally with a small group or even a moderately large group of 50 to 100 people. And so for entrepreneurs before they launch, I encourage them to really use and leverage that in your early testing, get people using the application, uh, as an entrepreneur, startup, or a founder, you don't want to make them because they're part of the beta test. You want to use that group as an early test to see whether the application is sticky. Um, for most tools, whether it's a productivity product or and certainly we've seen it in e-commerce or banking or other things, you want to see that people are using the app repeatedly because they want to, not because you're asking them to. And so you're looking for uh, a very simple viral coefficient, meaning that people are coming back to the app in some regularity, and ideally they're recommending the app to someone else. And so in the early testing of the application, you know, give it to 10 friendly people. You know, I gave it to my mom and my sister, I gave it to people in your family, and kind of see what happens. Are they actively using the app? Or, okay, son, I'll install the app, but then they don't go back. Again, if your target demographic is installing the app, but they're not really engaging on a daily, weekly basis, then it's a, hey, maybe there's some kind of tweak you need to make to the product. Um, I've never seen a big launch overcome a product that didn't have the right mechanics in it. And so I have seen big launches where, man, we put it out there and 10,000 or 50,000 people downloaded it, but once the big marketing push is over, and they're always, they're always over at some point, whether it's Apple promoting you or Google promoting you. You know, New York Times has written about some of our apps, and it's great, you get a little pop, but the pop will always be over, and you wanna make sure that the app sustains and grows itself, and there's no substitute to a great product. Yeah. So along those lines, I mean, especially since we operate in the productivity, self-improvement space, yep. we do expect people to engage with the app on a weekly, if not daily basis. So. How do you like strike a balance between making the app sticky so that people want to come back, but also forgiving so that when they do fall off the bandwagon, they don't feel like a total failure? Yeah, I mean, I think it's specific to uh, the particular product. Um, usually we look for ways that the user can opt into uh, the right amount of um, 
you know, I'll hesitate to use the word nagging, but the right amount of tension from the application. So if, um, and again, I haven't seen your particular app, but I've seen apps where, uh, like fitness apps, where you'll commit to a particular habit. Like I commit to you know, exercising X many times a week. Once you make that commitment, then you're essentially giving the application or the product permission to come back to you and nag you at some interval. And so you could certainly experiment with mechanics where you say, like, hey, you're signing up for a productivity hour where you're gonna you know, write your daily to-do and schedule time and do X, Y, Z. And once the end user has committed to those behaviors, then there's more mechanics that you are allowed to or may actually make for a better product for you to, to actually do. So I, I think about different mechanics like that. We've seen that. Uh, we've built some apps in the medical space as well where you know, the app's purpose is to remind you to do a particular either activity or take a particular type of medicine or injection or things like that. Once the user opts into uh, wanting the app to support their behavior, then you're actually providing a good product by by following up and doing that. Um, I know there was some app that would uh, really nag you. It would send you the push notifications, and then if you ignored those, they would actually have a robocall go to your phone, pick up, and things like that. I mean, there are extreme ways to go do it, but that actually makes for a good product if I, as the end user, have said, yes, that's I want this app to create behavior change. I think, do I have time for another question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the ideas that we've been experimenting with is like self-improvement sprints, right? Where you're only committing to a week or two of having to do a set of habits because life will inevitably get hectic and busy. Yep. Um, so something long-term sometimes feels very daunting. Mm -hmm. And I actually very often uh, affectionately refer to what we're building as like an agile self-development tool mm. where you are encouraged to run experiments on yourself and reflect and reorient um, and then see what's working and or try something out new. What are your thoughts on something like that that isn't so... I mean, I think it's a, it's a really interesting concept. Uh, my key feedback in the productivity space uh, is really to think about how you can get people who are not into the productivity space. Um, I find, and I'm kind of one of these like getting things done in, in box zero and I read about different productivity hacks. I am probably in the minority. And so as you think about productivity tools, a lot of them have to be, um, to be widely successful, they have to be used by people who don't think of themselves as productivity type folks, and so thinking about how do you build mechanics for the person who just wants to, you know, get a bunch of stuff done, they're not really thinking about their uh, their focus time or their work time, and uh, just making sure your product is broadly relevant. Uh, I think there's a lot of, obviously, great research that has gone into Agile and Sprints and works in kind of certainly the engineering and development space. and. I do think that there are opportunities to apply productivity, some of the learnings of productivities and stand-ups and grooming and uh, things of that nature to personal productivity. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you. This has been very helpful. Uh, I'll just end with a shameless plug. We are looking for more beta testers, so uh, if you're interested, please come find me uh, or leave some business cards on the table. Tweet out a link for everyone so they can find it. Yeah, I will do that. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Great questions. Uh, before we have the next uh, person up, I do want to just ask a few follow-up questions there. Also, uh, Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at this third mic. Uh, does not seem to be functioning at the moment. Hello. Now it works. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so just on that note of, of stickiness for, for apps, so you have, in, you have notifications, yeah. right? Uh, would you also advise uh, email campaigns where you uh, kind of get a person's email early on and, and get a kind of sticky user that way? Uh, I, I think it really depends on the application. You kind of want to meet your end users where they want to be met. Uh, and so uh, some folks prefer mobile and they want to comp compartmentalize. Uh, some folks would prefer to get notifications via text messages, and you see lots of larger brands experimenting and trying different things, uh, like my uh, ride-hailing service. Uh, and I think this is true whether you use uh, Lyft or Uber. Um, 
they will send you a combination of certain things that they will want to send via the application and certain things that they will send you through text messages. Again, I don't know why they've done that. Uh, my guess is that they've run some either analytics or statistics or they know certain messages get through better than others. But I think it's important to reach your users the way that's good for your product um, and that doesn't feel overly spammy. Um, sometimes emails are too chatty and mobile is really about the now. It kind of engages people um, in the moment. And so uh, certainly if your your product is something that requires uh, instant, like, hey, I'm waiting for a car, I need to get picked up now, um, being able to see that notification on your mobile phone and act on it is great. Whereas some of the things may be, uh, hey, here's your billing statement for the last month and um, you actually don't necessarily want to interrupt that person in the now. You know, they can look at it whenever they're, it's convenient for them to pay the bill. Um, so again, I think thinking through the communication method and modality and why people are being notified and what the purpose, what action do you want them to take and is it an action they should be taking now or you kind of, it's informational, it doesn't matter to you. Okay, great. And, and just one last kind of question on that. In terms of marketing and re-engagement campaigns, there's a lot of uh, ability now in marketing campaigns to, uh, if you're doing paid marketing like Facebook, Google, you can you can retarget somebody, uh, to, and you can actually specifically retarget people who have abandoned your app. And so if they abandoned via shopping cart or uh, they their productivity habits didn't quite end up catching, you could re-engage them in that method. Do you see a lot of success in, in going that? That route? Uh, I haven't seen a ton of success, but that doesn't mean there I it isn't out there. Uh, I think re-engagement campaigns are just generally can be very effective where someone has expressed some interest, but maybe they haven't converted or haven't done the particular action that, that, um, that they were thinking about. And so uh, I think there's lots of potential for using a re-engagement to uh, get uh, get more connected with customers, especially if they were thinking about something. So someone was thinking about, you know, buying a chair or a couch or something like that, and you engage them in the Wayfair app, and they didn't convert, certainly a re-engagement campaign to deep link them into that app to convert them. You know, th there's a lot of potential there. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, all right, so next up, uh, we are gonna have Christopher Haylett. All right, great, Chris, come on up. What's going on, Chris? Nice to meet Chris, you. Nice to meet you. And Chris, could you just introduce yourself really quick and let us know uh, if you're speaking on behalf of a company? Or yeah, yeah. So I'm Christopher. Um, I am the founder of an application called Sixpence. So essentially, it's a new crowdfunding platform with a, a twist on the method of giving. Um, some of you may have heard of Acorns. We are the roundup model of crowdfunding. So <coughs> say you want to support a charity or even your neighbor raising money for their kids' cancer bills, any, any sort of cause, um, you can contribute to that through Roundups on your daily purchase just happening in the background. So that's what we're building right now. We're in a closed alpha, uh, also with uh, sort of testing, testing users and getting feedback and developing our product. Um, and we're looking, we're planning to launch onto the uh, iOS App Store uh, within about a month. Okay. And so with that, <coughs> especially because with our with our product, we use Plaid, and uh, in a roundabout way, access people's finances and bank bank details. Um, we are really uh, it's a big priority for us to establish legitimacy and mm -hmm. trust early on. So, do you have any tips for establishing legitimacy with users, whether it be through the quantity and quality of ratings early on, or um, outside reviews, especially of either tech, charitable um, sort of sources, or even um, just popular media sources or anything along those lines? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna repeat some of the question. I think um, it n didn't necessarily get picked up in the mic. I know small room C folks heard it, but I think the question is, how do you get legitimacy <coughs> in an app? And we've certainly seen uh, lots of different techniques to get legitimacy. I think over time, your brand will give you more legitimacy um, you know, as you build up reputation. I think association with other well-established brands and partners can certainly uh, give you legitimacy. So if you said, you know, hey, our app is in partnership with, you know, the March of Dimes or the Red Cross or wherever, they are lending you some legitimacy, assuming that, that mm -hmm. that's actually how it works. And so some of that uh, will certainly help, um, you know, 
Apple and Google won't necessarily give you legitimacy. Yeah. They will validate your application uh, for the App Store, but they're not giving it a seal of approval or disapproval. Um, I think early on, some press can do that. I think uh, people do look at the App Store ratings and uh, thinking, you know, sometimes the App Store ratings are more reflective of the company than of the app. Sometimes they're more reflective of the app than the company. Uh, if you ever want to uh, entertain yourself with ratings, go read Yelp's reviews. Very often they're not about the app, they're about restaurants that people have visited. And you know, Yelp, one star, terrible food, <laughs> you know, <laughs> horrible service. Um, so the App Store reviews um, will help give you legitimacy. So thinking about how not only do you build a great product, because uh, people will review on the product, but you're also, um, you know, trustworthy, have good customer service, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Uh, a lot, a lot of times, those ratings are holistic, in terms of customers' experience with your product slash service. Um, I think starting small as a startup, having a couple things that you're incredibly good at, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is general advice, not 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 even specifically to this. Um, this app, but if as a startup you're really good at a couple things, mm -hmm. it gives you more legitimacy to do m a couple more things. Um, sometimes I see early stage companies trying to do lots of stuff to compete with a much larger company and they end up doing a lot of stuff poorly and then they kind of uh, hurt their overall legitimacy. So starting small, being incredibly good at the hyper-focused thing that you're doing, that will give you a little bit of reputation, a little bit of traction, allow you to expand a little bit broader uh, and build that reputation as well. Super. Um, so you mentioned uh, pop, like media can be can be helpful. Um, so starting out, acquiring those first that first bit of media coverage. Do you have any tips for that? Because uh, I imagine it'd be easier once you have some other media has covered you and you can point. Yeah, I mean, th direction. there are specific outlets that s target startups. Mm -hmm. And so um, certainly things like TechCrunch and Boston X Economy, uh, Boston Inno, um, you know, there's uh, Innovation Economy, which uh, Boston Globe covers a bunch of stuff. So uh, you kind of have to hunt a little bit around there and have those. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing I would say is think about what story you want to tell rather than the pop of the media. Because like I said before, you will get eventually some pops of the media, but it will dwindle down. Think about the things that you can be doing in terms of activities that are highly leveraged and give you long-term growth. Mm -hmm. And so again, if you're partnering with some other charities or nonprofits that have a much larger brand than you do, mm -hmm. like you should think about how you can tag on to their existing marketing campaigns and things like that. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, just the early history of Bill Gates and how Microsoft became incredibly successful. You know, it wasn't the operating system, and, and Bill was certainly super smart, but he tagged on his product to IBM's product, and IBM was a much larger company, and so he got to go along for the ride. And so that's great advice for most startups is think about how you can tag your products and marketing to much larger vehicle ships and budgets to help you grow as well. And so certainly for the marketing, but uh, for reputation as well, both of those things uh, might be areas that can help. Okay, very neat. Um, <coughs> and then uh, so something I had heard also on kind of the, the aspect of published media is that um, the importance of the re of having these reviews and having sort of user engagement, kind of uh, there's sort of a curve to it where at, at the moment of your launch or within a short period of your launch, it's super important to have it then and not necessarily later because the legitimacy adding factor kind of decreases over time if people see, oh, this had very little interaction or engagement for the first six months or something. Is that something you would say is true or it's uh. better to just get it out? I mean, I'm, I'm more of a get it out and iterate. Uh, most of the m incredibly successful products, they all had a launch, but it was the iteration of the product mm -hmm. that, um, that got it to be better and better and better and get more media. Ultimately, the reputation of the product is the thing that earns you additional media. Uh, there is kind of a freebie. Uh, it's easier to tell a launch story, like, hey, we're launching, like, it's exciting, this is what's happening. Um, but there's nothing to prevent you as an entrepreneur for thinking of other narratives that are also interesting for the media to tell. And so um, it's not 
always about the product, it's about what that product is doing. So uh, again, you're, you're uh, doing a roundup, uh, you know, keep the change type uh, mechanic and model. Um, you may be doing that, for, like name a charity that you're currently thinking about doing that for. So one of our early clients is one called Homestart, and every $900 that gets rounded up to them saves, helps prevent uh, homelessness for a family. So, that, so that's a great story, yeah. right? And thinking about what story can you tell using that narrative and framework in that time frame. So if you mm -hmm. say, look, this is going to be a compelling story. So let's say you launch next month. Uh, think about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, people want to write that story of like, hey, give back mm -hmm. to the homelessness. Here's this thing, right? It's not a launch story. It's a story about helping the homeless. And yeah. you've attached your brand with legitimacy from some newspaper to help the homeless. It's a feel-good story. It's good for your business. It's good for the homeless. Everyone, you know, writers love writing about that stuff, right? And yeah. that's one charity. You could pick off another charity. You know, hey, New Year's is after that. What happens after New Year's? People sign up to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And what's a potential charity that's associated with health and wellness and well-being? Again, you can yeah. kind of tell additional narratives over time. And Again, each of those will be a little bit of a pop, a little bit of a blip, and ultimately you want that to long-term be a growth trajectory that you really understand how it works. Um, but hopefully that helps. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Do we have time for one more? Is that about it? Uh, it's fine if that's about yeah, it. Yeah, we should all right, all right, all right. Super, thank awesome. you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Chris. Christopher. And so just a, a quick follow-up question to that is uh, designing for growth, uh, you can hope to get that pop out of the gate and that news coverage, but I think the hard truth is that most apps won't, right? And so uh, especially if you're taking the iterative approach, it becomes much more important to design your app in a way that can be grown. And so you can, if you're lucky enough to have uh, such great content as helping the homeless, hopefully you can you can get that coverage at some point when when those campaigns are going. But do you do you see that in a lot of the different apps in terms of adding features that are specifically designed for shareability to help the app either go viral or to help the app uh, encourage users to share something to sort of have like an Instagram moment within the app, whether it's achieving a goal or getting a badge or that sort of thing that they might share. I mean. I think it's good to think about those things. I, I try to attach or think about how your product can tell a story. Um, and when I'm thinking about storytelling in a product, uh, most stories have a beginning, middle, and end. And so uh, for a particular market, there's a, hey, what happens before I need your app or service? Uh, what happens during the time that I'm using your app and service? And what happens after I put your app or service away? Um, for every product, uh, literally every every product, every vertical, you know, you know, I'll take a simple going to the ATM scenario, right? There's the before, it's like, oh, I needed some money, you know, I checked my wallet. There's a going to the ATM, I need driving directions or I need to find the nearest one around me. There's I'm at the ATM getting money to put in my wallet and then I'm out somewhere spending. Um, there are a number of different engagement scenarios where the person may be thinking about mobile and mobile scenarios. There may be a number of opportunities where I may want to share something publicly. At the end of the day, you want to be building features into your product that support the narrative of whatever that storyline is. That could be a convenience story. You're, you want to be the most convenient, most versatile bank, and therefore the before story, the during story, and the after story is going to be optimized for convenience. like. Before, like we knew you were running out of money because we knew your spending habits, so we sent you an alert before you even needed it. Hey, you're about to run out of money this morning. You're going to be passing an ATM on the way. During, I didn't have to pull out my wallet. It knew as I approached the ATM that it would give me a thing. I just had to type my PIN in. And then after, it didn't print out a receipt that I had to crumple up and throw it away. It kept everything in the app, right? Each of those moments, uh, and that was kind of a hypothetical, may have a component of shareability or, you know, hey, I, I took money out, so maybe I want to notify my spouse so she doesn't do the same thing. There are natural moments where you want to either take s information and put it out into the world. And so thinking about the product of where you're actually adding value as opposed to noise. Like, 
we put share sheets in a lot of the applications. And they're pretty easy from a developer standpoint to say like, hey, here's a share sheet and you can share you know, a photo or text or video or whatever to uh, most of the social media. Putting those in the moments where people want to share is the thing that actually gets people sharing. Like just simply having it there is literally just a feature. Like we've built plenty of apps where there's a share sheet on a page that I'm like, okay, no one wants to share that piece of information. It's just not particular. I mean, it's nice, but nobody really cares. Uh, whereas if you put it in the flow of something where people are looking for that interaction, then it's actually super helpful. So thank you for that. So. Uh, just to make sure I kind of am taking away the right lesson there. So if you were advising, let's say, a banking app, um, and they didn't have a feature that said, let's say, you, sp you saved 30% more money this month than last month. If they didn't have that, would you encourage them as part of that story to say, well, that's really the end result of your app is you're helping people track their finances. And so you don't have that feature where you said you saved this much more money this month and you should add that and then you should add a share. Like, would you encourage them to build that feature out if they don't have it just so that it does get shared and help their app grow? I, I would think about the natural places where people want to do sharing outside of the app. And so again, in the banking scenario, when I'm finding a bank or I'm trying to coordinate you know, bills and expenses with my wife, you know, hey, would you like to share the fact that you paid this bill with, you know, other people who have access to your bank account? I may say yes. Whereas if it's, and again, banking is super personal, you don't typically share those things. It feels like a forced action. Whereas there are apps like uh, fitness and health apps where you really want to say, hey, I, I just completed this marathon or I just ran this thing um, uh, for, for things that are public that, you know, typically apps support a behavior that people want to do outside of apps, right? Like I use the, um, uh, the taxi example. Like people have been going from point A to point B for years and years. It didn't take Uber or Lyft to reinvent how we get from places. What they did is they took an existing behavior, which was kind of inconvenient, standing on the side of the street with your hand up, and they said, hey, we're going to remove the, be the before the hand up with a mobile app where you can essentially put your hand up digitally. We're going to remove the during the ride, and we're going to change that experience from kind of this yellow cab with glass enclosure to a different during experience. And we're going to change the after experience where you're paying and swiping and haggling over their credit card machine not working to something where you can just leave the vehicle and it's done and taken care of. And so they've thought about how to take an existing behavior and change some of the subtlety of how it's done, but not what is actually happening, the getting you from point A to point B. And so for folks thinking about products and services and startups, think about where to inject natural sharing. Like people already want to share things like photos, they want to share things like restaurants and where are the best places to eat, they want to share um, you know, and you guys share things all the time with folks. Think about the natural places where you may share uh, a receipt uh, from, from a bank or a bill or something like that. And those are the places that you want to facilitate that with software. You don't want to inject it into places where people just aren't doing that behavior naturally. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, so next up, we are going to have uh, Daria. All right. Excellent. How are you today? Hello. I'm good. Excellent. How are you doing? Hey, great. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Duria Doctor, and I'm founder for a company called Adisoft, still in uh, very early stages. But um, looking at building software for uh, healthcare services marketplace. Okay. So um, the question I had um, for you, Greg, is what would you suggest, what guidelines would you suggest for building apps for seniors, you know, folks less comfortable with mobile uh, technology. You know, it's an underserved demographic yeah. very much, and I think it's a lot of potential. Yeah, I, uh, we, we built a lot of applications. I do think it's, uh, it's underserved, and I think people from a design standpoint don't pay enough attention to it. Um, there are great guidelines put out in general by both Apple and Google. So Apple mm. puts out 
uh, what's called the Human Interface Guidelines uh, for mobile applications. Google puts out uh, their own guidelines called Material, material Design Guidelines uh, for designing applications. Most of these guidelines will address uh, legibility and fonts and dynamic fonts. And so uh, typography is one of the key things um, to make sure that folks can read it. I actually ran a study, a uh, small study, small sample size with my family and uh, friends where I asked them to take screenshots of what their email looks like. And uh, folks who are uh, over 50, 60 years old have very different fonts and setup on their phone, and we kind of forget that. And so I think it's important that, um, that we remember that in the design of applications that uh, you know, again, I usually keep my glasses on my forehead. I'm not quite at that that age, but uh, m my vision isn't as good as it used to, and this this kind of gets true more and more so. So, uh, folks should be thinking about fonts and legibility. Um, both Apple and Android provide great uh, technical tools for being able to change the fonts dynamically so that they're easier to read. Um, great application design also incorporates accessibility, and so um, mobile applications have a lot of built-in tools for uh, accessibility. That means that you can use the phone with, um, w with your, uh, without your vision. Uh, and so w we've actually worked with the Perkins School for the Blind on a number of different products. But what's good for people with vision impairment is also good for uh, you know, everyone else. It, it allows uh, much broader demographics to be able to use your products. So. Mm -hmm. I'd say fonts is a very easy one that if you're designing for an older demographic, you should be thinking about fonts. The second is uh, typography and iconography. Uh, a lot of modern applications will use icons assuming that people know what they all mean and oftentimes you know, three lines across, uh, which has become a de facto. Um, it's called a hamburger menu. It's in, typically in the upper left for menu is actually much uh, can often cause a lot of frustration. People don't understand that it means menu and they're not able to find it. So uh, I encourage my designers to think about how to put things on screen so that they're not hidden. Um, so that way, if there's a button and there's an icon on it, put a label under the icon. It makes it much easier for uh, folks to know what that means without tapping it to discover what it means. Um, the other principle is, um, uh, uh, inductive uh, user interface monikers. So we know what deductive means, where you're kind of Sherlock Holmes, and you're, you're like, oh, I know that's a you know circle with a line. That must be a search icon. Whereas inductive tells you what it is. That this is search. Um, you can even go further with deductive, where you know if you're on a particular screen, you'll see lots of screens that say things like, at the top of the header will be details. Uh, or it'll say search, uh, but it, it you still have to deduce what you're supposed to do there. Uh, and so uh, back in my Microsoft days, we studied this very deeply and found that if you can be declarative, tell people what they're supposed to do here, like rather than saying uh, details or contact details, fill in the details uh, and hit done. Right. Sometimes you don't have enough space to be wordy, but if you can be declarative and tell people what they're supposed to do, they will just go into automatic mode and do it. So if you say, fill in your, de fill in your contact details, they'll be like, oh, okay, here's my address name and telephone number and I'll hit done. Whereas if you say details, people will just be like, okay, details, I guess I'm done. And they'll leave the form blank, so. Very interesting. So I, but in all of these, I think obviously there's the trade-off between not having it too cluttered. Yes. Uh, because that confuses yeah. folks a lot. Yeah, I mean, great, great design, design is universal design. It'll be useful for everyone. And so I think w one of the things I really like about mobile is it's a constraint, meaning it's a smaller device. There's not enough, there's not as much room on the desktop. And so in the very early years of mobile, it was a very large constraint. I mean, you had to remove a lot mm -hmm. of stuff to make the screen simple. As phones have gotten larger and more complex, uh, companies have started to introduce more and more complexity. And so there's always a tension there. Uh, I do think that, especially with MVPs and early products, 
good design is very simple design, very intuitive design. Uh, we lean very heavily on usability testing, and so regardless of demographic, whether it's young, old, visually impaired, going through not just beta testing where you kind of throw apps out there, but bringing people in and standing over their shoulder and watching how they use products uh, is really helpful. Um, it always humbles me when I watch real people use applications that I design because I think I know everything and then I'm like, okay, I don't know anything. Uh, and I think it's important that uh, most entrepreneurs are humbled by the products that they think they understand because it makes us better. You have another minute? Yeah, sure. Um, so we talked a bit earlier about stickiness and you know how to um, ensure uh, to improve that. So my question is: Do you have any suggestions on what types of metrics to track in order to help you kind of? improve um, the app usage and stickiness. So one way is obviously you watch over the shoulders. Yep. But then when you throw it out, is there something you can track? I mean, what would you suggest you track? Yeah, I mean, each, each, each product is different. Uh, and so it's hard to say like, hey, there's one universal metric you can track to tell you if there's engagement or not engagement. I mean, we, we've worked on products that are tax products that you will literally only use once a year. And so you'll have like, man, we have tons of engagement. And then it's like nothing for eight months. And then again, it comes back up. So I think it will depend on the different product that you're building and designing for. And you should be thinking what are uh, leading indicators and what are lagging indicators. So a leading indicator is something that if you track this metric, it is likely to cause this other action. So, you know, your ultimate, you know, uh, a, a metric that most companies care about in some way, shape, or form is revenue. Um, and so, but revenue tends to be a, a lagging indicator. Once you have earned the money, it's too late. You can't impact it. Whereas, um, a leading indicator may be number of times that the application is opened. Right. The more times people open the application, the more likely they are to convert and use the application. Uh, we've seen gyms where the leading indicator is how often you go to the gym. If you go to the gym often, you're likely going to uh, convert and stay at the gym. If you start trailing off and not going, you know, it's likely that you're going to you know, lapse, lapse your membership. Uh, I know early on, and this was uh, Netflix has kind of shifted their model, but they used to track how long your queue is. So the more movies you would put in your queue, the more they felt that like you're not going to churn as a Netflix customer because they knew you had, you know, 50 movies lined up that you wanted to see, so you would unlikely s cancel your Netflix subscription. Whereas if you only had one or two movies queued up in your Netflix queue, they're like, ooh, this person will likely cancel. Uh, again, Netflix is now all digital, so I'm sure they have different metrics. Uh, that they track for uh, stickiness and conversion, but thinking about what are those things that are going to uh, be leading indicators as opposed to lagging indicators, and it, it does vary f per business. Uh, the other thing I would say is think about your metrics not as pure mobile metrics, but company metrics that are supported by your mobile apps, that if you're thinking, you know, hey, we want to reduce churn or we want revenue, that your mobile application metrics should be supporting whatever your company metric is as opposed to being this off to the side metric. Uh, <laughs> we should probably call it there, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I, I'll, I'll look for you in the Q&A, though. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a follow-up question or two on the on the analytics pieces. Um, so, the uh, the different platforms that are out there, like Kochava is one that I'm familiar with, that allows you to do app attribu app attribution. So, if you're marketing across various platforms, you can you can track your Facebook campaigns, your Google campaigns, your Pinterest campaigns, etc. How important is it that small startups use something like the Facebook analytics or Kochavas of the world in order to get that, that data? Uh, I think it's important that you're tracking metrics in some way. It actually, as a startup, it doesn't matter to me how you track it. Uh, there are a lot of analytics platforms out there. You should be putting something in your apps to track some amount of usage. Otherwise, you're really uh, kind of 
blind to your end users, but whether it's uh, you know Localytics or Google, you know there's uh, Apptentive. There's a ton of different platforms that you can be using to track. Uh, in the early stages of a startup, like I said, you can be looking over people's shoulders and just asking the question, are people really engaged with my app? Are people downloading it? That can be your metric. But as you get more sophisticated, you definitely want to get similarly more sophisticated with your analytics and your A-B testing and split and um, you know various quadrants of users and what they're doing and how they're behaving. But those are things, kind of those deeper analytics that shouldn't, scare off early entrepreneurs like early on you just want to make sure that your basic metrics that you're tracking it may be opens it may be session time it may be um, other very simple mechanics that oftentimes these analytics platforms will give you out of the box don't put in analytics unless you have the time either yourself or within your team to go look at the data and so we certainly see a number of startups that spend inordinate amounts of time instrumenting their application and they don't have anyone to actually look at the data. So it's like, awesome, that's a lot of data, but no one's looking at it, so it doesn't matter. So kind of balance the amount of time that you're spending instrumenting and putting in analytics to the amount of time that you can actually look at the data and that it's helping drive your business. Um, and do you recommend, in order to make that useful, that people also track everything they change within an application in order to sort of have control groups and, and to make sure that they know this changed on this state. And so if you move a button and your retention goes down, you can go back and kind of correlate it and say, oh, my 30-day retention dropped by 20% after June 5th. And you can go back and look at it. Like, Do you feel like people that it's important that people record yeah, everything you, they're you changing? You should have the macro level things. I mean, you're going to know, like if your, if your conversion rate or your customers drops off a cliff, you know, you don't need something written down in an analytic system to say, uh, you know, we screwed something up big, let's go fix it. Uh, I do think it's useful to have some basic metrics that you can be monitoring on a daily basis so that you're learning about your problems before your customers learn about your pro problems. So, you know, we've seen servers go down or backends not working, you know, someone put in bad data, your app starts crashing because Apple did some kind of update or something of that nature. You want to make sure you're catching those as quickly as possible. Um, but again, don't go crazy on analytics unless you have uh, bodies to actually monitor it and make sure that it's getting fixed. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so next up, uh, Jonathan, uh, actually, sorry, Jonathan, uh, we will have you up. Uh, Lisa Yang, we're actually going to, Jonathan, if you could, uh, is it Jonathan? I'm s I apologize. I got the order wrong. If we're going to, uh, you'll be next up. Uh, Lisa Yang, are you here? All right, come on up. Sorry, the confusion about that. Nice to meet you. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Yeah, if you um, could just oh, sorry, oh, uh, introduce yes. yourself, that'd be great. Yes, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, my name is Lisa Yang. I have two passions. I'm currently the community manager at Thai Boston. It's a global not-for-profit, so we work with entrepreneurs and investors in uh, fostering the growth of the next generation of entrepreneurs. Um, so that's one. And the second one is, you know, I'm a budding entrepreneur myself. Uh, it's kind of hard to not be inspired working every day with entrepreneurs to start my own. Um, so right now it's trying to under understand, you know, how can I support the nail industry such that um, a nail artist, a nail tech can only see one client at a time. But what if they could see 50 clients at one time? So that's what I'm trying to figure out. And um, you know, I suspect that a, a mobile app could be a vehicle that helps deliver that solution. Um, so my experience, I don't have a technical background to give everyone a context. I don't have technical background. However, uh, through my past projects, I've been able to work on an app and help drive that in uh, the later inception of it. So a lot of um, questions that I have are from the failures of developing an app. Um, and these are things that I'm going to be taking with me into my own entrepreneurial journey so I don't repeat that mistake. Um, so the first question is, you know, after... Oh, actually, let me just give you context. So for one of these projects, a budget was set in place. Um, there was no project management until after the app was already built. Um, so in the end, we became, we were over budget, and the app is not where it needs to meet the original goals. What's next? 
Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a tricky one. I think uh, we've certainly seen um, we've seen projects coming to us that are in that state, um, and you know, software is hard. And there, there's just no shortcut to saying that that lots of things can go wrong in terms of mobile products. And so I think f as an entrepreneur, you have to kind of evaluate where you are and where you want to go. Um, I think the first is a technical evaluation of you know, of the stuff that's already there, is it in good shape to continue developing or does it have to be scrapped? Um, and I think getting some sense of that, uh, you know, long term, I, I generally advise entrepreneurs have a technical co-founder. Um, again, a technical co-founder doesn't have to be there on day one, um, but most companies that view themselves as a long term technology business should be looking to have a technical co-founder. So if I were in your shoes, I would be looking for someone who is interested and in shared your passion for the particular business area and had enough domain expertise that they could give you a technical evaluation of whether the existing code base was something that could be worked on or whether it was going to be scrapped. Um, you know, that's probably first and foremost, I think, uh, even when we see code bases that are scrapped, there are often uh, some good fundamentals or lessons learned. Um, as a um, startup, most of uh, most even successful apps end up being scrapped in some way or another. As a product company scales, it starts to um, outgrow uh, its original design intent or the original uh, vision of the product, and so it may have been built under a certain set of assumptions, and then those assumptions change as your uh, company pivots. As the company pivots, new features change, old features go away. And uh, for most of the products, you know, three years, four years in, you know, the engineers will start telling you, like, look, you know, it's the product's at a point of complexity where you either have to do some significant refactoring or uh, consider re rebasing the product as well. So um, I would take it as a, hey, you know, your first product rev, rev is happening sooner than you wanted, so there, there could be positive lessons learned. I think when um, going forward, if, if you find a technical co-founder, or you even say, say you don't, uh, finding either uh, someone who can do that technical evaluation and then really putting a groundwork in place for how you get the MVP out there. As I said early on, you really don't need a very complex full-featured product. As a startup, you want something very simple to prove, uh, prove if there's a market or prove that there's not a market, especially if you're at a stage of the business where you haven't raised funding. You want to make sure that you're uh, trying to experiment fairly cheaply, like uh, some of the startups that we've worked with have certainly done uh, quarter million dollar apps and up, and so it can be very expensive. But uh, usually I encourage early stage startups to do some of the experimentation, some of the prototyping, wireframing, um, even usability testing in low cost scenarios to at least validate that there's a market there, see if they can get investors behind the product to allow them to get to the next level. Um, mobile as a whole has gotten to a higher level of sophistication, so it's harder to throw an MVP together, people have a higher bar of expectations, but I'd say evaluate your current code base, look for a technical co-founder, and then plan what your go-forward strategy is, whether it's rebuilding it from scratch or doing lightweight testing, raising funding, and then going out. Again, it's going to depend on your business a little bit, but um, that'd be a little, a little bit of how I'd think about it. Thank you for sharing. Um, and, you know, let's say concluding this app project, in the end, you decide to kind of just wash your hands and and uh, either start anew with a new firm, app yep. development firm, or just close it off completely. Yep. Um, so what if, if, what if a company decides to actually move their app development with another dev uh, company? Yep. How, do you, how do you break up with your, <laughs> <laughs> how do you break up with your previous uh, app dev team? So yeah, we, we've, we've certainly been on both ends of, of uh, that conversation. I mean, we generally, uh, expect that most companies will want to take their code internal in some way, shape, or form, that as companies grow, uh, their value that the application should be bringing to them should be exponentially growing year over year, and so they're going to want to have some technical c capability, which is why having a technical co-founder is important. 
Um, in terms of the handoff, you know, typically we recommend uh, just making sure you have access to the source code. Uh, so typically when you're ending a relationship with one development firm, they're gonna wanna get paid, and in return you get a copy of the source code. Um, and so making sure you have that. Again, if you're parting on good terms, they'll typ typically do some kind of code handoff where they're willing to sit with uh, whoever is being handed off to uh, just to part on good terms for whether it's a couple hours or a couple days to make sure that the handoff is smooth. Uh, we've certainly been handed code where the former entrepreneur didn't part on good terms, in which case uh, we kind of have to look under the hood ourselves and try to figure out what was going on. And again, we'll give the assessment of how much of it is in a solid state and how much of it might need to be scrapped. Um, so uh, again, I if you can end on good terms, it's typically a better way to end, end things holistically. I know it doesn't always end that way, especially if promises were made and then it didn't meet up to expectations. Sometimes that, that can be a challenge, but um, I would also advise uh, internally understanding what were the shortcomings and the things that went wrong and try to avoid um, assuming that the follow-on development firm has the same mistakes or problems that the first one did. And so we, we've gotten into uh, situations where we were taking over, I call them rescue projects, where something went sideways, we're rescuing a project. Because it's a rescue project, the formal entrepreneur has a very low level of trust and they want to be super hands-on with everything, which can make the f rescue go poorly as well. And so just understanding, like, you know, put the chips on the table of what went right, what went wrong, and what each party to the to the next project is going to do differently. So, when working with the new, um, you know, app dev team, what are what are some high level things to look for in this new potential partnership? Yeah, I mean, for for most people, I say it really should feel like a partnership. Like you need to have expectations of what they're going to do, what they're not going to do, what they're expecting you to do, uh, what technical decisions get made. You know. Uh, startups especially tend to be uh, resource, con resource constrained in a number of ways, both uh, capital and cost. And so uh, being very clear with the company in terms of what those constraints are so that they know like, hey, you can't go past my budget of X because then I literally run out of money and I need to launch this. Uh, some startups have been very clear when they are very clear and we've launched a number of uh, startups that are like, this is my budget, I haven't raised more, I need to launch this, like, let's plan for that to make sure I get to market, I have a little bit of a launch window, and I have a little bit of time to raise additional capital, otherwise it's gonna go sideways. Um, some companies aren't very transparent, and they just say, it's fine, I'll pay the bills, keep going, and uh, you can get into trouble where one side of that equation doesn't match up, where you know we've certainly had startups that where go full speed, just allocate a full team, let's go, 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 and then they don't pay their bills, and then the team gets upset, and we have to roll people off, and you know, so just being honest and transparent and trying to set up the relationship in terms of a partnership, um, I think helps uh, in terms of what the development company's bringing in terms of skills and capabilities, and what you as an entrepreneur are bringing to the table as skills and capabilities. Are there any pros and cons on working with a, either an offshore dev team or an onshore dev team? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be about communication and quality. Uh, you know, there are certainly, you know, right point in the agency that I'm with and uh, has offshore resources when we need them, and there are certain places that that's a useful thing. Most of our app development is done uh, in Boston uh, or Oakland, California, so we prefer onshore for most of the core product engineering, but certain tasks of support or certain uh, functions can be offshored. I think communication is uh, paramount in any kind of application development, uh, whether it be mobile or web. You want to make sure that you as an entrepreneur are collaborating well with the team from both a product and design standpoint. And so um, you can definitely get lower costs, uh, significantly lower costs offshore, but you can sometimes pay for that in terms of communication and your vision and connection with customers. So, you know, it's diff diff different depending on what you want as an entrepreneur. Thank you. And do we have time for one more question? Oh, we're actually going to have to call it there. Okay. But I'll look for you in the Q&A as, Q as well. Sounds great. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Jonathan, I apologize. Come on up. Hi, 
Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. My name's Jonathan, and I'm the founder of an early stage startup called Daypop, which is a event recommendation platform. And what we do is we use, uh, or we aggregate events from a bunch of different sources, and we apply machine learning so that we can personalize the event discovery process. And in this way, it helps people enjoy more of the experiences that they are passionate about, and less on the frustrations of search and the notion of FOMO. So we're in a short couple weeks, we're going to be launching our, our um, open public beta for college students in the Boston area. And I guess one of my biggest questions, or at least one of the things starting out, was that um, was there really a need to have a native app, or could, I, could we be fine with a web app? In a lot of ways, I felt that native applications had this perception of a higher quality or, or this sort of um, premium experience. But I think that as web technologies sort of um, developed, it seemed like it was a, an acceptable place for us to get started, and I wanted to get your thoughts, Greg, on the need to have both. Yeah, I would say for, uh, we work with a range of companies from very large Fortune 100 companies to startups. Uh, when you get into mass adoption, it usually ends up being both, that you'll end up needing uh, a richer, deeper experience and then a lightweight experience. Uh, for startups, web is a great way to start. In many ways, you can get very broad reach on multiple platforms, but it really depends on what you're what you're doing. Like, there's no magic wand. I get this question all the time: of you know, should I be building a mobile app or a web app or native or not native or hybrid? Um, I think it is a little bit in dependent on the company and the business and what you're trying to do. And so, you know, in the event space, you can certainly think about uh, Eventbrite and Meetup and some of the other folks that are in there. Um, web is really useful for those because it makes it very easy to learn about events without having a deep engagement, meaning that I can tweet out a link, uh, which I did this morning. People click on the app link even if they've never heard of Meetup before. They discover the particular event. There's very little friction for them learning about this particular event and engaging. Now, I happen to do a lot of Meetup stuff, uh, and so as a long-term... I'm long-term invested in the brand of Meetup. I host a number of Meetups here in Boston. We host one in San Francisco as well. So I'm an organizer. I'm deeply passionate about that particular brand. And so by installing their app on my phone, I get a better end user experience because I'm connected more holistically with that brand. And so as a startup, you should be thinking about the same thing. Um, web is really useful for attracting new audiences with very low friction. Uh, and so you click on a link, all of a sudden it's there. You don't need an extra step. Um, with certain types of interactions, especially where you're getting deep engagement with a brand or you're trying to access certain functionality of the phone that is otherwise not available, then a mobile app can give you a lot of stuff. Um, like in the event space, as an example, um, by having a native app, you can have access to the end user's calendar. And so you can see when their free busy time is. So I could certainly imagine um, a product saying, hey, I see that you're free on Thursday. This particular thing is available on Thursday. You know, I already have all your information. One click, you can go see the Beatles. They're playing on Thursday. They're back. It's amazing. Um, and so that would be a good reason for enabling a, a native application to do something that a web application could not. Um, obviously, with a web application, that experience would of discovery might be different. And so just thinking through what does each platform get you, um, and I usually divide it into does it give you uh, ubiquity, meaning that it's on every device, it's on everywhere, which web gives you ubiquity, or does it give you excellence? And native applications can give you certain elements of excellence that uh, web applications can't give you, whether it's access to the camera, a QR code, augmented reality, calendar, push notifications, a number of other things as well. So just thinking through what's the end user scenario. Um, web is often, uh, because it gives you ubiquity, it can give you access to multiple devices uh, more, uh, more cost effectively, uh, but sometimes that engagement is lower. So it, it depends a little on what you're trying to do. Uh, thanks. And the, the other question I had was concerning around, I guess, uh, when you, after post-launch, when you start to scale the feature set of, of your core business and the things that your users were used to, 
I guess what are some of like the pitfalls that you have seen inherent with a lot of companies where they try to introduce things that maybe overcomplicated things and what you feel um, I guess startups should be really be aware of when trying to continue to ensure that they're still successful one year later, five years later? Yeah, I, th I think this goes a little back to the previous question on analytics and what are the lead things that you want to track? Uh, what are those things that your startup is about? Um, I would say startup founders should be thinking of the mis mission and vision of your product. Um, oftentimes I see products that become a collection of lots of different features, uh, which is okay, but it's not, uh, it's not clear from an end user perspective. And so having kind of clarity in terms of uh, what your company's mission and vision is um, helps you decide which features make sense within your product and which ones don't. So if your um, if your product company mission vision is uh, you know recommending the best events every every week or something of that nature or making sure that people are living a more fulfilled life because they're being entertained and they're connecting with their real community as opposed to their digital community or whatever that vision is and then thinking through well okay how can I introduce features that support that mission vision, right? There's gonna be some things that feel really natural, like looking at your calendar, finding things, doing social graphs to connect you to other people who you can attend those events with, you know, socially sharing that application with other folks who wanna attend, maybe paying for those events if they're a paid event. There are gonna be natural things that fit, fit into that vision, and there are gonna be other things that are just totally random that, you know, someone from XYZ company wanted you to do XYZ feature and they don't feel authentic to the brand or where you're going with the business. I think it's important that entrepreneurs have cemented in their head what their product vision mission is and then try to say no uh, to the things that don't really line up with that. Uh, and then be analytical and looking at the metrics of the things that matter. There's uh, so many features that you can be doing in a technical product and some of them will move the needle and some of them are just features and so trying to be selective about the things that uh, will move the needle both for the end user and for uh, your business. Do you have any thoughts on the, this whole um, uh, aspect of user engagement in terms of especially in the consumer experience um, gamifying sort of like like, I guess, engagement and getting users to come in and kind of retain and reduce that churn, I mean. Yeah, I mean, you know, gamification is kind of a, uh, it, it's a weird term. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about psychology. And so you wanna be thinking about uh, how do you keep people, uh, how do you stay relevant and useful to folks? Um, there are elements of game theory that work because games are fun. Uh, and so, you know, mechanics like unlocking of levels or uh, certain reminders or badges, you know, those mechanics work because of psychology. Uh, and so understanding uh, both game theory and some of those mechanics may be useful to your product. They may not. Um, again, as an entrepreneur, you should be looking at all avenues to uh, grow your market and your base. And so uh, we certainly see products where uh, there's a natural competitive behavior uh, in the product, and so elements of game theory or game mechanics or badging uh, may feed into uh, the natural things that people want to go do. Like um, we're building a competitive gaming app right now. Uh, it's in the, the sport, sport space, uh, and there's a lot of competitiveness built into it, and so if you can build in features that that kind of hit that note, uh, and consumers are psyched. They're, they're super excited about the game mechanics and, and what it does. Again, there are places where you can force it where it doesn't feel like it makes sense at all. So just thinking about psychology and learning about some of the mechanics that people care about can help engagement, certainly. Um, help retention, help, and people enjoy it too, and that's, that's probably, the, these things work because end users enjoy them. If you get it wrong, then you're actually annoying people and you'll have the opposite effect. Do we have time for one more? Uh, I have to come back to you in the Q&A as well, apologize. Future question, don't ask if you have time for one more, just ask it. <laughs> but thanks so much. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Jonathan.
All right, so that concludes uh, that part of our uh, AMA. Uh, to make sure that we have enough time for, for Q&A today, I'm actually going to kind of cut down our, our chat here just a few minutes shorter. Um, but there were one or two questions I did want to get out, and then we'll move to, to Q&A and open it up to the room. That sound good? All right. Um, so one thing I skipped over uh, in my introduction that uh, when we talked prior to today was clearly extremely important to you um, was just how passionate you are about kind of improving lives through technology and design. And so I was wondering, on a day-to-day -day basis when clients come to your firm, how does that sort of uh, kind of personal belief that, that is clearly important to you change how you think uh, about developing software? Yeah, great question. Uh, I'll actually kind of do a little bit of a preamble. So when I started my company, um, I started in Coolidge Corner in um, uh, not too far from here. And uh, I used to sit in a coffee shop. And when people said, Greg, what do you do? Uh, my kind of mission vision was, and I would tell folks, I make software that doesn't suck. Uh, and yeah, because there's a lot of software that kind of sucks out there. And so I was like, I want to do the other kind. Uh, and as the company kind of grew and evolved, I kind of tweaked the mission vision and how I articulated it. So I'd start with that. And then I realized, well, building things that don't suck is kind of a low bar. Like we should be more aspirational. And so I pushed for building things that were awesome and things that were impactful. Um, and uh, I saw a great video, if you haven't seen it, uh, and there's a book, book about it as well called Start With Why. Uh, and it's by Simon Simic, and it talks about um, thinking about the why you do the things that you do, not just the, the action of doing them or the how that, that you do them. And so I started asking myself, like, why do I care about software design? Why do I care about building things that don't suck? Why do I want uh, to build things that are impactful? And, you know, at the heart of it, it was I want to be helpful and I want to improve people's lives. And so that got me to the I want to improve lives through technology and design. Uh, for me, um, you know, I've always had a passion for software. You know, grew up on a Commodore 64 and Apple IIe's and all, all sorts of stuff like that. And then the design aspect for me was always scratching the the visual and the user interface and the typography and how these things fit together to be uh, beautiful and useful. And so for me, that felt really authentic. And I was like. I really want to do that. And so improving lives is kind of broad, and it doesn't mean to stand on high like I'm carrying cancer every day. It's really how can I help people. So I'm hoping I'm helping some of you folks uh, today and maybe some folks who are watching this video. But it's really how do we make better software, right? And I think everyone should uh, be thinking about the well, why am I doing this? You know, why am I starting this company? Um, and I think some of it can, can certainly be personal, like I'm doing it for myself to have money, to be successful, to send my kids to college, uh, which is great, you should do that. Um, but you should also think, well, what is, is there a higher purpose that I could be building my, my company for? And think about how to articulate and tell that story, because it'll not only kind of light your own personal passion, but it'll help um, people, co-founders, other folks who you're interested in bringing into your business as well, uh, kind of see that larger vision and, and do something bigger than themselves. Excellent. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Um, last question here before we go to Q&A is you've touched on it, probably some of the points I would imagine today uh, as part of the AMA questions. Um, and certainly you touched on the pitfalls, I think, in, in answer to one of Jonathan's questions. But I would imagine that most of the people in this room are not funded in $100 million B series at this point. Maybe some of, them, some, some of you are. Um, if so, congratulations. Um, for those who are on the smaller side of a startup in terms of resources, and are really, you know, a lot of hands went up for the growth. Yeah, what are the main things that you advise people that they should do? What are the kind of top two or three things that you generally tell people at that stage that they should be doing and thinking about? Yeah, I mean, y you should be talking to your customers. You should be really understanding what they need, understand what behaviors they currently have today. Um, and so whether it's a nail salon or charity or, you know, event planning or event discovery, a lot of times people are solving these problems today. You know, they may be solving them poorly, they may be solving, solving them without technology. And so as an entrepreneur, you kind of have to get out there to really understand these problems. And I would also encourage entrepreneurs who are thinking about mobile to 
really download and play with a lot of apps uh, to understand what works and what doesn't. Um, oftentimes, entrepreneurs have trouble communicating their desire uh, in terms of an application experience because they don't they lack the vocabulary, uh, which is okay. Like you don't have to know how to code or how to develop, but knowing. You know, I really like the onboarding from this app called this, if this, then that, or I really like the way that, you know, Instagram does X, Y, Z when they take a picture. Also, having a how you get there vision, you know, you're not going to have all the features in your application on day one. Uh, it has to have, as in fact, as little as you could possibly have it. And so being kind of incremental as a CEO or an executive saying, okay, I, I need an app that does just one thing and I want it to do it really well. And then, you know, maybe the following month it'll be like, okay, now my app is going to do this one thing and it's going to help a little bit with this other thing. And so just being agile and really delivering a little bit of value, incrementally adding to it, incrementally adding to it. Um, if you're able to do that, your app will be incredibly sticky. You know, one, one of the apps you, you mentioned, one of our first uh, mobile apps was RunKeeper. Um, the app did very few things in its version one. It didn't, it didn't uh, like today's version has so, so many features in it. Um, the first app, all it did was collect your, your latitude, longitude, and tell you how far you ran. That was it. Um, and so it was really that MVP and saying, hey, we have a good story behind it. Uh, we've built a lot of different apps, but as a startup, providing a little bit of value, not overcomplicating your product, having really good conversations with your customers to really know what you need to be building for them to deliver unique value and kind of uh, the tenacity and fortitude to keep going. Awesome. Thank you very much for those tips. Okay. Uh, so with that, we'll go to the Q&A. Um, to the three people who uh, had additional questions who came on stage, we'll definitely try to get to you. I do want to start with a few uh, new hands up if, if there are any. And just grab a mic here because we are recording this uh, for later. So if, if you have a question, come up to the mic. And uh, I see the hand in the gentleman in the back. Thank you, Greg. It was a great presentation. Um, I was wondering if somebody is starting in the iOS world using Swift 4, are there any templates, libraries that they can use free or paid? Uh, so t templates and libraries for Swift 4 type yeah, of Yeah, apps, some apps that are rudimentary templates that they can start with. Yeah, I mean, th there are a ton of resources online. Um, and I think if, uh, are you just learning Swift or are you a developer? That's right, uh, Swift 4, yeah, Swift that's 4. what, yeah. Yeah, th there's a lot of really good courses and material. Like when we first started mobile, there's literally nothing out there, but Ray Wunderlich has a bunch of really great courses. Stanford has a free mobile development course as well. Um, highly recommend both of those resources to go check out. Uh, there's plenty of templates on uh, GitHub uh, for app even fully built applications. I think if someone's starting out, I do recommend some of the Stanford courses and the Ray Wunderlich courses for beginners. Um, there's a number of books on iPad programming and iPhone programming that will take you through lesson by lesson, building up your knowledge and experience so you can build something more sophisticated. I wouldn't start with a template that has a bunch of stuff in it. You really have to start with a uh, hollow world so you get the, the basics of view controllers and how these things wired together. Thank you. Absolutely. I used uh, Ray Wendelick as well, and that was how I learned to program in Swift. Yeah, and it's great. It's a really great resource. resource. Go ahead, next, just come on up to the mic, for, form a, a queue. Uh. Hi, I'm David Garapi. Uh, I'm working on a mobile-first web app uh, for gyms to host nutrition challenges. Uh, one of the things I would like to hear from you is a little bit about pricing and how um, you, know, you can get feedback from the customers on what they're willing to pay and how to basically go through that. Yeah, I, I would say on the pricing side, it used to be that there was a fairly large market for paid apps. Um, I'd say most of that has uh, bifurcated into two areas that I see paid apps. And I'd say even in those two categories, it's really challenging. Um, the two areas are typically utility type products and uh, games entertainment products are paid apps. They're typically under $10. My general advice to entrepreneurs is you probably don't want to base a business on either of those two business models because they're incredibly high churn. I usually advise companies to think about how they can have long-term sustained revenue 
uh, through any number of channels. So if, uh, wh what business did you say you were in? So it's a, um, it's a mobile app that allows a gym to host a nutrition challenge. Okay, so if, if you're building an app that ties into a gym business, thinking about how you can have a business model that is sustained by either incremental revenue that the gym is making so that you're getting paid by the gym rather than the consumer or in some other way uh, might be a direction. Uh, again, the, the money already flowing into gyms by having gym memberships, you may be able to offer a gym uh, better retention in that their churn rate is lower because people stay members of the gym longer. And so your business model of charging 1% or $5 a month for the gym to be able to use your service, that revenue may dwarf the potential revenue you could get by charging 99 cents or a dollar or $5 for the app. So I, I would think about how to tie your revenue model and your business model into something that's already existing, like the gym's revenue model um, from a monetization of the app in and of itself, uh, we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs have a lot of challenges uh, just because it's not sustained revenue. You know, you'll have a little bit of incremental revenue if you charge, you know, a couple dollars from it. There are some apps that have made a go of it charging for the app itself. Uh, a lot of the bigger ones have done it on a subscription basis. Um, there's very few that have done it on a one-off purchase. The ones that have done it on a one-off purchase, they typically end up being premium. Uh, meaning that the app ends up being in the $29, $49 range. Um, and so, again, depending on what the product is, that is a hard price point barrier to get to on the premium side. That's why I generally recommend folks try to think about an existing business model that you can either provide incremental or add-on revenue. So one of the things I'm looking at now is um, splitting it up between N like B2C versus B2B and mm -hmm. having features for athletes versus features for gyms. Um, and on a subscription basis, is there anything, you, you know, is there any input you could say that would kind of make that successful? Or have you seen success in yeah, that I've, space? Yeah, I've, I've seen things in that space. I would recommend as a startup, pick one to start with. Uh, I, I think the fact that you could get to multiple revenue streams from both a B2C and B2B is great. Uh, but as a startup, I would be like, okay, decide who you're gonna give it away to for free to. So you may initially give it away for free to consumers and charge the business or give it away free to the business and charge, like pick one. And then over time, you'll, you can certainly offer a, a premium version to consumers or a premium version to businesses. But by focusing on one, I think you'll get better traction um, than by s trying to simultaneously do both. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, hi, uh, my name is Richard Cadet. Uh, I currently own a, a part of rental company, but I've been working on a, a new uh, web-based platform called um, RK Community, and it's really to focus on the customers to have um, unlimited access to a wide range of rentable items. Um, and the way it works is kind of using allowing small businesses like myself as well as individuals to offer the items on our marketplace. However, uh, we also allow users and small businesses to store their items at our warehouse for a small monthly fee which means if a customer does book an item, we will help deliver the item to the cus uh, consumers on behalf of the vendors, so it helps the safety and convenience on both sides. Um, and I'm not a tech guy, um, so what I did is after talking to some of my tech friends and seeing how much it costs to create an application, I kind of geared it, uh, shifted gear to create my own web base using WordPress, and now it's fully functional, and we actually have some, I actually have some mem um, people who signed up and actually um, Rented products um, through that uh, through our uh, through the web base. However, uh, my question to you is, when should I kind of uh, switch gears? I know you said to have both is really good, um, but like when should I switch gear to actually create the application? Um, to um, is it when I have a tech guy or a tech ga uh, gal, or is it when I work with an uh, application agency like like your company? Um, so when should I do that switch? I mean, it, it's going to be a little bit specific to your business, so it's hard just from, from this to know that. I mean, you want to get to a level of scale and revenue mm -hmm. where you feel confident that the development of an application will have a return on its investment. Um, if you had venture capital, that return on the investment is done in a five or seven year horizon. If you don't have venture capital, you're going to be very capital secure. You don't want to invest 
you know, whether it's 50 or 100 or 200 grand, unless you think you can get a return on it, the fact that you have some traction already via, you know, whether it's WordPress or WooCommerce or something similar is great. You can have a little bit of a model on the economics of what it costs you to rent an item, get an item, procure it, kind of operate it. And then you have to ask yourself, how do I scale my business? And so there's a couple ways I could imagine you could scale. You could either scale geographically, uh, meaning that you could partner with other, you know, uh, either tool suppliers or tool rental locations to say, hey, I want to not just service my neighborhood or my facility, but try to expand nationally. You could also expand via platform saying, hey, I, I want to service not just be, be a web responsive, but via mobile as well. It really depends on, on some of the numbers um, in terms of what your revenue is versus how much you want to scale. I think it's great that you rolled up your sleeves and you're like, I'm just going to figure it out and get, get the thing working in one way, shape, or form. I think that's a great way to build an MVP. And then looking at whatever your current traction is, saying like, okay, well, if I improved what I put together in WordPress, you know, do I think I could double my traction? Do I think I could triple it? And kind of at what point is it doesn't make sense to actually invest either the capital to hire someone internally or to hire an external firm to do it. So that's kind of a um, risk reward uh, calculation. It's hard to say. Um, you'd have to kind of look at your own numbers. Like, you know, do you think you could get an additional 100K, 200K of revenue in six months, 12 months if you built a mobile app uh, or not? And kind of when do you want to pull the trigger on it? So it's kind of a do you invest or do you grow organically? And you know, that, that's very personal to each business. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come up to the mic so people can hear you? Uh, Wait, this gentleman, and then we'll come over to you. Uh, hi, Greg. Ted Finn, co-founder of Uplift. We are a mobile app that provides a guided solution to resynchronize your body clock to your new time zone, effectively neutralizing jet lag. You do this in about 10 minutes when you land at your destination. And one of the issues we've been grappling with is the discussion on stickiness because we're a very specific solution that you use and then you put it away. So just wanted to get some insight in terms of how yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, some, uh, and I don't know enough about your particular product, but not every product makes a great business. You know, and we've certainly seen... Uh, certain apps are good for marketing or PR. I know there's an app called Flux that's that's in your space that kind of changes the um, the tone and resolution of your screen or the color to give you either more blue light or yellow light. Um, I think they give that app away for free. I think they've had a hard time monetizing it. So I think in terms of engagement, again, I would think about your audience and how do you attach your your audience to the things that people are already engaged with. And so, uh, again, I would think about um, travel and airlines and things like that. Like, could you license your app or module technology to you know, either JetBlue or Emirates or someone where there's already long uh, you know, jet lag flights, uh, you know, things of that nature where you could give it away to their consumers for free you know, by downloading you know, one of their popular products and then uh, you know, have a licensing business model as opposed to a direct-to-consumer model. Um, their application already has a behavior where they know when you're booking the flights so they can send you the jet lag notification or whatever. So I would think about how to attach your behavior to existing behaviors, existing apps. Um, it might be difficult for you to have a standalone app um, uh, and charge for it. Again, I think it might be easy to have a standalone app and give it away for free but you'll still have a marketing problem of how do you get people to know about your product. Um, so We do have a, a B2B solution for corporations because this is a huge productivity problem, and there were quite a few companies that have expressed interest in, in piloting the solution on a, on a paid basis. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I would... I would as an entrepreneur, you kind of have to knock on a lot of different doors and try a couple different avenues to see if you can get uh, more and more traction. Um, and then for yourself, you have to have uh, some metrics in terms of, hey, what's working? What does success look like? Um, you know, just evaluating, you know, if you blow it out of the water, is this a 
million dollar business, a five million dollar business, a ten million dollar business? W what do you want it to look like uh, as it grows and scales? And then you can kind of measure your progress against those goals. Thank you. Yep. Hi, my name is Jada. Uh, well, I'm a computer engineer student right now. So my question will be basic. Where should I start? Which concepts should I get familiar with? Or like, what do you suggest for like starters? For yeah, like yeah I, I think if you're learning, uh, learning computer science or learning mobile, you know, I, I suggest just rolling up your sleeves and trying stuff. If uh, you're on a PC, the easiest thing to start with is Android, Android Studio, and kind of getting your head wrapped around that because it's very accessible on a PC. If you have a Mac computer, you can download and install Xcode. Um, Swift Playgrounds, uh, if you have neither of those devices and happen to have an iPad, Swift Playgrounds is a really easy way to get your head wrapped around some of the basics of mobile programming, uh, and it's available on the iPad as well. And a lot of great basic tutorials of uh, little functions and little screens and transitions that you can build. Um, again, you have to kind of decide what type of product you want to build. I'd say the most traction, especially students get, is when they build something that's useful for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know. I would think about what simple day-to-day -day problem you want to solve for yourself is, and then um, you know install and whatever your phone you're carrying around it with, whether it's an iPhone or an Android device, and then try to solve that problem. Um, you know, start with simple tutorials. Uh, you know, like I said, either Stanford classes or Ray Wonderlife. There's other ones online as well, and build a little Hello World app. Um, my uh, when we started doing mobile development, we had an intern and. Uh, during the internship program, I said I had the intern design an application that would be useful that only had one user interface screen. And so his first homework was to think about what that might be. He ended up building a little mortgage calculator. It only had one screen, a couple inputs, a couple calculations, a couple buttons. Um, and so he designed a very simple calculator. He figured out how to get iOS to do what it was supposed to do. And uh, we ultimately released it for 99 cents and ended up making 50 grand, which paid for his internship and then some. Now, that was the early days of the App Store. You can't do that anymore. Uh, you'd have to give away the mortgage calculator for free and uh, market the crap out of it. But uh, think about something that you want to do just for yourself that you would be passionate about and you would enjoy learning and doing, and then just stick, stick with it. What about like concepts like Agile and Scrum and like gamification? I think like those that. concepts uh, are really more effective when you're on larger teams. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, cer certainly Agile and Scrum is a, is a methodology for working in larger teams. It's less, uh, it's, uh, and again, uh, there's certainly some elements of that that you can apply to yourself uh, for personal productivity. But when you're just learning, you just want to be learning. And I think spending some time learning, learning the tools and learning the craft and playing around with it. From a computer science standpoint, um, you want to learn the fundamentals and the basics from simple algorithms to UI screens to how to wire up buttons to functions to some of the other basics. And, and most of the tutorial things that I referenced, they'll have you know, course by course, class by class, week by week, you know, whether it's 10 week courses or, or uh, three month courses or things like that. So just Start with something simple. Start with something that you're going to be personally excited to go build. Um, get it working. It'll probably be terrible and awful, but that's OK. You'll iterate and get it better and better. So. OK, thank you. Yep. Uh, we are going to have to end it there as we have hit uh, 3.30, and so that does uh, kind of hit our end time for the day. I do want to uh, apologize that we didn't get back to those extra questions. Um, I believe Greg did say that. I'll uh, be hanging around, so come, come chat with me. Perfect. Um, and then for anyone who has to take off, uh, I believe you said it's at g -Rays. At g -Rays, yes. At g -Rays on Twitter. Uh, thank you for those three who did yield their extra questions. That did allow us to get to the Q&A for everyone else in the room today, so that really helps. So thank you for that. And uh, if we get a big round of applause for Greg. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.